Good morning, happy Sabbath, church. I'm very happy to be here on this special Sabbath, is it not? But before we get started, let's, uh, let's start with a word of prayer. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for this weekly opportunity to, to come to your house of worship. I ask that as we seek your counsels on the education of our children, you give us just a tiny portion of your wisdom. I ask that as we support and make decisions for the youth of our church in regards to schooling, I ask that you be our guide. We ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as you can tell, we're talking about a very specific topic, right? I want to talk to you about a something that I'm very passionate about. I want to talk to you about an organization or a program that focuses on teaching children the the creative arts, one that encourages children to be critical thinkers, one that teaches children about the appreciation of the natural wonders of of the world surrounding them, and one that teaches children the good works for the community. Amen? We all on the same page here? We, We want our children to be an organization like this, do we not? Well, these are the ideas and the core values of the After School Satan Club. You see, the After School Satan Club is operated by the Satanic Temple. And they're a club just like any other club you might find at a, at, at a public school. You see, you might go to an elementary school, you might find a glee club, you might find a, a dance club or a chess club, and then you'll also find the Satan Club. A federal district court issued a, a preliminary injunction uh, earlier last year early last year, ordering the Saucon Valley School District near where I live to allow the after-school Satan Club to meet in their district facilities. The club is intended to act as an alternative offer to religious after-school programs, a place where children can learn about a secular view on life. And because we live in a free country with the rights of free speech, right, amen, the same way you might find a Christian club at your local elementary school, you may also encounter the Satan Club. The Supreme Court ruled in 2001 that schools operated a limited public forum, so as such, they may not discriminate against religious speech should a religious organization choose to operate at their facility. Therefore, if Christian clubs are fair game, then so is the Satan Club. And here's a news report I pulled for you. I asked for the AV team to help me out here. Uh, A news report uh, regarding this club. The After School Satan Club met for the first time here at Holmes Elementary. This has controversy brewing throughout the school district and the community. I let my kids believe in whatever they want to believe in, as long as they're happy and it's not hurting them or hurting someone else. Christina Long sorts through her kids' bag. Got some pencils and we got a sticker. New school supplies from her kids' new group. The After School Satan Club. Did your kids have fun today? Oh yeah, they had a blast. They can't wait for the next one. It's sponsored by the Satanic Temple. The after-school program is popping up around the nation and in many schools that also give space to Christian groups. In Ohio, there's three, Lebanon, Eaton, and now Wilmington. We look to Satan as a symbol for standing up to tyrannical authority. To us, Satan is a symbol. Um, It's like Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. The new group isn't about conjuring up spells. Instead, June Everett, the after-school Satan Club national director, says it's about critical thinking, creative expression, and inclusion. We don't talk about Satanism, um, even though we are non-theistic, meaning we don't believe, again, in a supernatural Satan. Um, we don't talk about, we don't push it on the kids. This sticker was one of many things passed out to kids in their goodie bags this afternoon, and this group will meet once a month. Reporting in Wilmington, Danielle Dindak, WLWT News 5. The after school say.
is that invert values and delete God from the equation? Why do we seat them in front of, uh, of instructors, that, instructors that belittle scripture or ridicule faith? If we immerse our children in evolution and atheism and secular humanism, should we be surprised that they become skeptics or, and when they spend more time in the world than they do at church? We bring our children to Sabbath school. We bring our children to church so that they may learn the truth. But then why do we send them to a school where they learn something different? Let's read Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Do we find this verse etched in, in, in the mission statement of the Why I'm Missing Area Junior Senior High School? Do, do we find this motto on their flag? I know of an educational system that does. A school that before diving into coursework always starts with a word of prayer. Because they know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When God is put at the forefront of education, not even the best universities can compare. And we see this in Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 3. The context behind Daniel chapter 1, starting in verse 3, we see that the king ordered one of his chief court officials to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. And these men, among being handsome, they also had what? They also had smarts. They showed brains. They showed aptitude for every kind of learning. They were well informed. They were quick to understand. And here's the important part. In verse 4 of Daniel chapter 1, it tells us that the chief court official was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Okay? Skip down to verse 17. We'll read here. Verse 17. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom, verse 20, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. What difference was there in the education that Daniel and his friends received and the education that the pagan wise men of Babylon received? All these men received the same education of the king's college, king's college, right, taught by Ashpenaz, the chief court official. They all received the same education where they learned the language and the literature of the Babylonians. But verse 19 tells us what? The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And that's the first point I want to bring out today. As the foundation of this sermon, higher education will never compare to higher education, okay? You can go to Temple University, you can go to, to Drexel, to Penn State, UPenn, you will have a wealth of knowledge. There's no disputing that. But what stood out about these men? Was it only knowledge that they had? What did verse 20 say? In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the other magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. Wisdom and knowledge, two distinct concepts, right? What, what, what is knowledge? Knowledge is the accumulation of information, right? Knowledge is the accumulation of information. So what is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of that knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, of knowledge, of understanding, and of education. I'm by no means saying that faithful Christians in public schools can't have this wisdom of God. That's not what I'm saying. I grew up going to public school. I went to BMA only my sophomore year. But what I'm saying is that God was the source of the wisdom that Daniel received. It was the intentional, godly education that Daniel and his friends had in Israel that made him stand out in Babylon. And it was there where God poured his wisdom upon the young men. Daniel and his associates, as described in Prophets and Kings by Ellen White, were youth born of a royal line in Israel. They had been trained by their parents to habits of strict temperance. They had been taught that God would hold them accountable for their capabilities, and that must never dwarf or enfeeble their powers. This education was to Daniel and his companions the means of their preservation amidst the demoralizing influences of the court of Babylon. No power, no influence could sway them from the principles they had learned in early life by a study of the word and works of God. 
What was true about the godly education in Israel and the secular education they received in Babylon is also true today about Christian education and secular education. Because secular education is man-centered. Christian education is God-centered. Secular education is world-focused. Christian education is word-focused. Secular education is informative. Christian education is formative. The higher education of Babylon was no match for the higher education that Daniel was rooted in prior to captivity, and the same stands true today. Ellen Ellen White writes in her, her book, True Education. The title of the book is True Education. True education means more than pursuing a certain course of study. It has to do with the whole person and the whole period of existence possible to human beings. This is the important part. True education is the harmonious development of the spiritual, the mental, and the physical powers. What is true education? Implicitly, if we talk about true education, what does this tell you? This implies that there must be a false education, correct? True education is not schooling that prepares you for for the next academic level. True education is not education that you need need to pass to get to middle school or to high school or or to grad school, to college, whatever it may be. True education is not just a course of study. It has to do with the whole person, the harmonious development of the spiritual, of the mental, and the physical powers. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Why Adventist school? Because it offers true education. Amen? The harmonious development of the physical, the mental, and the spiritual faculties. And that's what we'll start with, the spiritual aspect. If you go on Blue Mountain Academy's website, and amen, I heard we have a a recruit coming to Blue Mountain Academy next year. Amen? If you go on their website and you look up their vision statement, this is what you'll see. The mission statement. To be a center of true education for students around the world. What does that mean? Look, Look at their mission statement here. The mission of Blue Mountain Academy is to provide a Christ-centered Seventh-day Adventist education that leads students into lives of service for God. Who is the focus of this mission statement? Everything BMA produces within its students culminates to be a life of service for God. God is the focus. My wife and I, we attended Fairview Village down in Norristown for years. uh, And down the street from the church, we have the Norristown Area High School. And I looked up their mission statement. The mission of the Norristown Area School District is to educate and inspire all students to become lifelong learners, to strive for continued growth and personal excellence, and to demonstrate the skills and knowledge needed for success in a diverse and global society. And these are beautiful things. Lifelong learners, personal excellence, skills and knowledge to succeed in a diverse and global society. But who is the focus here? I am the focus. It's lifelong learning in my life. It's personal excellence for me, skills and knowledge for me to succeed in this world. And I even looked up the mission and vision statements within this school district, this school district, the, the Governor Mifflin School District. And here it is. The Governor Mifflin School District mission is to educate, inspire, empower every student every day. The district will equip students with varied opportunities to develop and enhance their artistic, musical, athletic, and leadership attributes. And these are all great things. Arts, music, exercise, leadership. Individual success, though, is not enough. A huge component of the the lives of these children is not being addressed. It's not sufficient enough to to merely prepare for a job or a profession or a career. It's not sufficient enough to only become a productive citizen of this society. It's not enough to be a lifelong learner when we know our life on this earth is peanuts, right? Right? It's not enough to learn the skills and knowledge needed to succeed uh, in in our speck of dust society that we call earth. We must be prepared for what? For heaven. Because only there is our 70 or 80, 90, 100 years max, right, becomes extended by the grace of God into an eternity. We must give our young people an education that is consistent with our faith and that will form their character to endure the test of time. And Seventh-day Adventists believe that the primary purpose of education is not to get a job, but to prepare you for God's kingdom. 
And I'm saying the primary purpose, because of course they're, they're, of course they're concerned with kids getting a job and, and, and education, but that's, that's to come. I'm thinking back to my days at BMA. I'd wake up early in the morning. Sorry, early in the morning. Where'd she go? 7 a.m. for choir practice. Depending on my schedule, I might take classes all morning, or I might, I, I, for, for this example, I took classes all morning. I'd have, we'd have worship in the chapel at 11.30, then take an hour for lunch, then I'd head over to the boys' dorm where I worked at the front desk. Then it was time for dinner, then an hour of general recreation time, followed by evening worship, and then study hall in our dorm rooms until, until it was time for bed. We were provided with structure, a structure with, with God-centered emphasis. And I want to show you some research, some cold, hard statistics here. In a longitudinal study that surveyed over 800 participants born into Adventist families, it looked at a sample of, three, of students in three categories. Here are the three categories. Those who never received Adventist education. Second category, those who received one or more years of Adventist education. And those who received 11 or more years of Adventist education. Three categories, okay? The study analyzed whether the student went on to get baptized or to remain unbaptized. As you can see by the dark green, the 59.9%, nearly 60% of children who never attended Adventist education went on to eventually become baptized. Amen? Look at the role the parents have in the spiritual lives of their children. Nearly 60% of those who never attended Adventist education went on to eventually become baptized. The children who received at least one year of this education, nearly 85% went on to get baptized. That's a near 25% increase in just one year of Adventist education. And finally... The children who received Adventist education from kindergarten through high school, presumably, nearly 97% would go on to be baptized and join the church. This is a good-looking graph, right? Look at the steady increase. The correlation that the more time a child is involved with Adventist education, the more likely they are to join the faith. But of course, there's another side. There always is another side. If you compare the number of unbaptized children who received over 11 years of Adventist education with those that never attended any Adventist institution, you'd find that these children from Adventist families would be 13 times more likely to never have joined the church. Are we all still awake? The children from Adventist families who went to public school or, or other private schools or homeschooling, wherever they went, they were 13 times more likely to never join the church. Now, of course, baptism doesn't equal retention, right? Just because I got baptized at age 12 doesn't mean, doesn't mean I'll still be in the church at age 30. Another study, the Robert Rice study, looked at retention and it studied public high school graduates and Adventist academy graduates over a 13-year period after graduation to see where they would be. And there's a lot going on in this graph, but I'll cut to the point here. Only 37% of public high school graduates were baptized and still attending church 13 years later after graduating high school. 37%. And that's compared to 77% of Adventist academy graduates. In essence, young people are twice as likely to stay in the church 13 years later if they had graduated from, from an Adventist academy. Not a college. I'm not talking about university. I'm talking about high school. 63% of young people from Adventist families who graduated from public high school were no longer involved with the church 13 years later, compared with only the 23% mark of the young people who graduated from an academy. And the same ratio is seen not only in, in, in church attendance, but also in returning tithe and, and marrying an Adventist, right? What, what is the next aspect of true education? We talked about the spiritual. I've heard many critics. I'm sure parents have heard critics uh, of, of, the, of Christian education. Belittle our Adventist schools because they say it's not preparing our students academically. Have we heard this? It's not up to standards when compared to, to other public or private schools. 
But note, true education does not neglect the course of study. True education has to do with the whole person, the whole period of existence possible to human beings. Not only is true education concerned with the course of study here on earth, but as we've discussed, also their eternal enrollment with God. Adventist education emphasizes practical skills and the development of a solid work ethic. And this is highlighted by the fact that Jesus spent how many years? The first three decades of his life in the carpenter shop, learning and perfecting a practical skill. We also see this at BMA's vocational education program. As part of the vocational education program that the academy offers, I was required to have a job on campus. Why? The website says here, the program's objectives are to encourage students to develop an appreciation for work as a vital part of life, to teach students good work habits, to provide for students to earn part of their school expenses. If you want to pursue a degree in nursing or auto mechanics, Southern Adventist University has a, has a program for you. If you want to pursue a degree in business, Pacific Union College has a degree for you. Speech pathology, Andrews University. Medicine, Loma Linda. Engineering, Walla Walla. Psychology, Oakwood. But what about these critics of our education system? With 85,000 teachers and 1.5 and million students, and in 7,500 schools, how do we stack up to secular education? The Adventist school system is one of the largest Christian educational systems in the world. We are second largest, to be exact. And from 06 to 09, a research project called the Cognitive Genesis Project, it studied how more than 50,000 students in more than 800 Adventist schools performed academically compared to students in public or another private school across the United States. And here were the results, very, very bullet points here. Adventist school students in the U.S. scored half a grade level higher than their predicted ability in all subjects. Students who transferred into an Adventist school saw a significant improvement in their test scores. Also, the more years a student attended an Adventist school, the more their average achievement increased compared to the national norm. Why Adventist school? Because it offers true education in the way of practical skills, and it excels in their curriculum. And finally, why else should I send my, ch my child to, to an Adventist school, or for this aspect, what, more specifically, a, a college or a university? Why should I send my child to a college or university uh, of the Adventist institution? True education captures the spiritual, the mental, and the physical attributes of the longevity of humankind, the physical relationships. Does it not make sense to immerse yourself with like-minded individuals? Does it not make sense to develop lifelong relationships with our brothers and sisters, those of the same faith? Does it not make sense to find a lifelong spouse with the same beliefs and values that you have? No? Am I talking to myself out here? 2 Corinthians tells us what? 2 Corinthians 6.14 tells us not to be yoked together with unbelievers. The Bible is here warning us not to be unequally bound, or some translations say, with unbelievers, Right? The odds of finding a spouse whom you'll be equally yoked with at an Adventist school are a lot greater than finding a spouse elsewhere. The relational component of Adventist education is the third and final criteria of true education. For a young person to make these life-changing decisions at age 18, right, on their future career, right out of high school, that, that's enough pressure. But then when you start throwing in this relational aspect, it, it can become paralyzing, our, Advent, our universities are located in what is jokingly called Adventist meccas, right? We have Collegedale, Tennessee. We have Berrien Springs, Michigan, Loma Linda, California. The list goes on. They're major hubs for Adventists. And what a blessing it is to say that I met my wife on her first day of high school in 2007 when we were just 14 years old. What a blessing it is to say that we attended and graduated from the same Adventist university at Southern do you remember that rice study I mentioned earlier? I want to talk about marriage. Results showed evidence of only 27% of public high school graduates marrying an Adventist spouse, a Christian spouse, whereas nearly 80% of Adventist Academy graduates married someone of the same faith. The study tells us that they are three times more likely to marry an Adventist if you graduated from an Adventist Academy, high school. 
Before Southern Adventist University was called Southern Adventist University, it was called Southern Missionary College. And it's no coincidence that SMC, Southern Missionary College, was jokingly called Southern Matrimonial College back in the day. True education means more than pursuing a certain course of study. It has to do with the whole person, with the whole period of existence possible to human beings. It is the harmonious development of the physical, of the mental, and of the spiritual powers. As we know, getting a Christian education does not guarantee a perfect Christian walk. That's, I'm not here to mislead you. It does not guarantee a lucrative career. It does not guarantee strong and godly relationships. But the odds are in your favor. Which brings me to the last point of today, risky business. Do I need to stand up here and tell you about the garbage that many schools are teaching our children nowadays? Do I need to inform you about all the propaganda and the manipulation public education and secular society is putting on our kids? The books being read in public schools, a whole community out there who granted may be a small minority of the community chanting, we're coming for your children at their pride parades. Of course, there are many wonderful teachers and instructors in the world, and they only have the best intentions for our, for our youth, but this isn't always the case. Much like anything, there are risks. Psalms 1-1, everyone still here? We have our Bibles with us? Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step, in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of who? If you, take a child, if you take a child, take your children, put them in the company of a mocker, some versions say in the seat of the scornful, if you take a child and put them in the seat of a scornful teacher where their faith is ridiculed, where the Bible is ridiculed, their religion is ridiculed, over time, at best, what happens to the child? They become apathetic about their faith. At best, apathetic. At worst, they will be antagonistic about their faith. And Psalm 22, verse 33, 32 goes on, 22, 32 goes on to say, guard my what? And let evil deceive me not. Guard my what? What are we talking about here? And let evil deceive me not. Is this not our daily prayer? Amen? When we are at the seat of someone with seeming authority and they lead us astray, how can we guarantee that we will not be deceived? Can someone pull this verse up for me, please? Psalm 22, verse 32. I want to see what translation you have. Pastor, if you have your Bible on you, can you please? Psalm 22, verse 32. If there is anything I've learned in graduating with my bachelor's and master's in psychology, it's that as human beings, we are very easily susceptible. Is that true? If we give someone 30, 40 minutes in front of a group of people, and they can, they can, sometime, they can mistakenly be viewed as someone we trust, someone with authority, who holds our best interest? Guard my heart and let evil deceive me what? Does anyone have a different translation? Pastor? What's your version say? This verse doesn't exist. I made it up. Yet I was able to get you to pair it along with me exactly what I was saying. And I'll ask again, when you are at the seat of someone with seeming authority and they lead you astray, how can we guarantee that we will not be deceived? No one is safe from deception. And it won't always look evil. But as we've seen through history, even at the Garden of Eden, deception disguises itself. I'm up here today. I've been entrusted to, to preach truth founded on scripture to the Kenhurst congregation. If you can be deceived in here, our youth can be deceived out there. The After School Satan Club is not trying to actively convert our children to become worshipers of Satan because that's explicitly scary and evil, right? They are simply trying to dispense with all the irrationalities of Christianity. Deception in disguise. As we've discussed, the mere existence of true education implies the existence of an insidious, false education. And it's, it's too easy to try to find a compromise between God's word and lies. Our children in their formative years should not risk becoming susceptible to the company of mockers or the lies that go against the word of God. Martin Luther once said, I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. 
There is a risk to public education. There is a risk of apathy. There's a risk of antagonism, a risk of atheism, a risk of deception. There is a risk in placing your child in the seat of the scornful. There is a role that the church must play to teach the word of God, to teach strong academics through the school, and to cultivate a heart for God. Matthew 28, 19. This one's real, I promise. This is, this, is, this is a real verse. We know the Great Commission, do we not? Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the, name of the Father, of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Christian education is the responsibility of the church. There is a mandate to the church to teach whether or not we have biological or adoptive children, whether or not they're grown adult children or they're school age, we have children in Christ that we vow to be responsible for every time a baby is dedicated at these steps. I pulled a portion of the script uh, read at my daughter Sophia's dedication in which the pastor, the pastor asks the congregation, will you do all that you can to provide a place of spiritual worship in this community where the baby will hear the full counsel of God's word? And will you be faithful in providing a ministry for instruction and discipline? And will you demonstrate affection and kindness to all our little ones? Are we providing a ministry for instruction and discipline for our children? We answer in the affirmative every time a baby is dedicated. Although you may not have biological children in school, we have a responsibility as a church because every time a child is dedicated, we become responsible for them as well. If you can't support financially, there are other ways to support. Volunteering, find ways to support with your time. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. This is for parents. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on who? Your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. You can con a con. You can fool a fool, but you cannot kid a kid. A kid will pick up in an instant if you are being a hypocrite. You cannot have a broken family at home, an absent father or a neglectful mother, and expect to send your kid off to a Christian school and have them make up the difference. In that same breath, we cannot have a church that, that talks about the importance of our youth, a church that can identify what our youth need, but then in turn does nothing about it. The Pennsylvania Conference dedicates three of the nine Sabbaths every quarter to our loose offering going to elementary education in Blue Mountain Academy. A third of our offerings every quarter go to our schools. We cannot talk about the importance of Christian education to our children if we are not actively supporting and encouraging the children and parents alike to make this sacrifice. Because it is a sacrifice. Parents, when we were fully, when we were fully submerged in the baptismal waters and recognized that the death of self and rise into new life in Christ, we knew that the Christian walk would be no walk in the park. Right? It takes sacrifice. In general, we have a team effort, and Ecclesiastes 4.12 tells us that a threefold cord cannot easily be broken. Parents, church, and school, with the same philosophy, creates a tremendous foundation in the life of a child. Parents, teach your child about the love of God. Be an example at home, because you're going to spend a lot of time and a lot of investment. But if you're not going to be an example at home, they're going to sense that and they will take the path of least resistance. Church, be the love of God that these children learn about at home and encourage and support our children to go to our schools while they will, while they will grow to be this love unto others. The responsibility of Christian education isn't given to our parents, to the parents, it's given to the church. There is a mandate to the church to teach the gospel and to teach all things whatsoever has been commanded. Does anyone know, I'm wrapping up here, does anyone know what the first Adventist boarding academy was in North America. Mount Vernon Academy in Ohio, the first Adventist boarding academy in this continent, it was the very first academy put on North American soil. Can anyone guess their enrollment numbers for fall 2023? How many students were enrolled this year at Mount Vernon? Anyone want to take a guess? Zero. Zero. The school closed in 2015. 
there is a decline in Adventist education. According to an article by the Adventist Review, 70% of our children don't attend Adventist schools. Where are the children? What are some reasons why, why there's a decline in Adventist education? Cost? Definitely. But you see, if there's less and less kids, the cost keeps going up. So it becomes kind of the self-fulfilling prophecy. If we don't send our kids to Adventist education, then there's more of a financial burden, and it creates more difficulty for parents to send their kids to school. There's a pre-K through grade 12 uh, school not too far from here. It had 81 total students last year. Of those 81 families, only one family has a baptized Seventh-day Adventist parent or guardian. Who are these other children enrolled in our schools? This is a mission school. There are potentially 80 non-Adventist families who have seen the benefit of our Christian education and are paying to send their children to learn in this environment. Christian education doesn't cost. It pays. The best investment we can make is in our children. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's a matter of a parent's executive decision to keep their child at home to be homeschooled. Ultimately, of course, this is the parent's decision. But the benefits of attending Adventist schools are clear. Our responsibility to support these institutions are clear. As parents, we unfortunately, we can't do it all on our own. The same way the church can't do the parent's role, the parents can't do the school's role, and the school can't take on the parent or the church's responsibilities. It's parents, church, and school working together. Maybe it's a matter of inconvenience or convenience, right? Maybe you can't get busing to get your kids to school every day. Maybe there are other things that public schools might offer that, that Adventist, Adventist schools simply can't, right? And then it becomes inconvenient. We start to weigh the pros and the cons of Adventist education to public schools or other Christian schools. There's also a certain element of parents not willing to sacrifice. One of the reasons that boarding academies are closing is that parents just simply say, I, I can't send my child away. It's a difficult decision, of course. I'm sure it was a difficult decision for my parents to send me away at age 14. And you know how it goes. You're in high school, then you're in college, and then, then you get married. It's a frightening thought. I have a two-year-old. I don't even want to think about it. I get it. But the blessings that I get, that, that I got from having attended this educational system, the blessings my parents get from seeing the seeds that, that, were, that were sown when they sent me to Blue Mountain Academy, this is invaluable. If you went to a boarding academy, you have friends today that are closer than just friends, right? They're closer than just high school friends. They're closer than the neighbor you grew up with. They're, they're closer than the colleagues that we lived with. Every waking hour, they, they, these are friends that, that we toured together in the choir with. They're in the band, in the bell choir, in gymnastics. These are friends that we attended church with. These are friends that we shared communion with. And the last thought I want to leave with you is a question. Who is raising your children? Children spend on average 6.64 hours in school per day, 33 hours a week, 133 hours a month. Who is raising your children? I'll ask again. We bring a child, we bring our children to Sabbath school and church so that they may learn the truth. But then why do we send them to a school where they learn something different? But as we've seen, Christian education isn't the end all. The school can only assist. It cannot replace what the parents are supposed to do. The school can't do for the children what the parents aren't doing at home. But when we have parents, church, and school with the same goal, as Ecclesiastes says, a threefold cord is not easily broken. I pray that, that parents with school-age children pray to God about the, le the, the best learning environment for their kids. And if it's finances that, that are the only obstacle... Our church family has resources. Our church organization has resources. Our schools offer tuition assistance. I pray that current students making decisions for, for their future seek true education, one that emphasizes the relational, the academic, and the spiritual aspects of life. Students who are in and who have gone through Christian education, I want to encourage you guys today to be thankful that you have parents who sacrifice for you to be in Christian school. Be thankful that God's given you the privilege to have an education like you've received or are receiving. May God continue to strengthen our families. May God use this church, our schools, and you as parents. And may the three work together to bring up the children in the nurture and the counsel of the Lord. We will now close with a, a hymn. I do not have my uh, bulletin on me.
I'm sorry? Hymn number 590. Our, 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 our RJA students, I'd like to invite you up at this time to join us for our closing song. And our congregation, I'd like to, for you to stand with us as we close with our closing song, Trust and Obey. The words will be on the screen for you. <laughs> 